Good day to you, Mrs. Beatrice Peltzman. My name is Yeshayahu Perry. I have the honor to interview you today, October 8, 91, here in New York, in the name of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And we would like to hear your pre-war story first, and then how you experienced the war and post-war adjustment. Please tell us your story. Well, I was born in 1926 in Berlin. I don't remember much of Berlin because I was rather young. Uh, the only, you were asking me if I remember any uh, anti-Semitic incidents. I was too young, but I remember one thing, my brother coming home with Jude written on his back. I didn't understand, I was too young. As I'm getting older, I'm getting younger and younger when I leave Germany. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we left around 32 or 33, I'm not sure, uh, and went to Warsaw to my grandparents. Let me just mm -hmm. ask you another question. I mentioned that you have some photographs. Yeah, I think I have. I, I would like you to show me some family photographs and telling me what's their kitchen. Well, I was lucky. The, the uh, I was lucky that they were rescued. This is my this is my parents' wedding. I will say at this point, of course, everybody got older. There's about one person still alive. My uncle, who is down here, is 94. But I would say about 80% of them were killed during the war. Okay. And then this is my mother when she was young. And uh, they say I look like her. I don't know. This is a family portrait with the, nun uh, the, the nurse. This is yourself. The little there. girl is me. All the to the summer. And this is your brother? My brother and my mother and my father. Okay. I don't know. I think I'll no. hear my parents. That's a picture of my parents. Mm -hmm. A gentile girlfriend of mine rescued mm -hmm. those pictures. Yeah. Mm. Okay, the other ones we'll talk later. Yeah. So what do you remember, what do you recall from your family life? school life or preschool life in Germany before you left In Germany, Germany, I just remember first grade a little bit. That's all I remember. I remember more about Poland. Um, my father went to, Warsaw, uh, to, to Belgium, and we were with my grandparents. And uh, because we didn't have a passport, the Germans took uh, our nationality away. So we waited for three years until we had a Nansen passport. You mean in Poland? You in waited. Poland. Where yeah. in Poland? In Warsaw, with I my see. grandparents. I see. And I then see. we went to Belgium, so uh, because we finally made it. My father was in Belgium. He so started a business. So you had some more family in Poland from the mother's side and from your father's side. They, uh, what? You had more family in Poland. Oh yes, which everybody was stayed in, in Poland when you while you left to Belgium. Oh they yes, stayed in we Poland. were the only ones that left. I mean, that was before the war. And all of them stayed in Poland. They all stayed in Warsaw, and my parents, my father's family, was from Stry, Galicia. And nobody survived of this family in Poland. Uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, survived. Hiding, hiding in the Warsaw ghetto, mm. and, and a cousin survived. In street, no. Um. Okay, so let's go on with your personal story. You left finally Poland. Yeah. And you went to. I went to Belgium, Brussels. Yeah. What do you remember from the pre-war life in, in Brussels? Brussels? Oh well, I remember everything from pre-war. My father had a cosmetic factory. And, uh, but he was usually very short of money because he believed in spending more than what he had. And um, in 19, well, the, the Germans came in 1939. Yeah. I remember it was a day that I was waiting impatiently because I had a new raincoat. And I was waiting for rain. And I heard the thunder, but it was the Germans who were bombing the air, airport. And uh, I remember one of the things I remember is that I, my mother had these old fashioned candlesticks, you know, of her great grandmother. And she always said, Beatrice, when you grow up and you get married, I'll give you those candlesticks. 
And I decided that I was going to walk out with them and bring them to my girlfriend, Jeanne, who, by the way, rescued a lot of my things. This was already in 1939? 39. The first day of war. And I remember my mother saying, where are you going? I said, I'm taking my candlesticks to Jeanne. And she said, the whole world is falling apart. And she's thinking about her candlesticks. Let me just ask you another question. While living in Belgium before the war break out, mm -hmm. You probably, you still had some family left in Germany? No, uh, not in Germany, in Poland. In Poland. They were all in Poland. Did yeah. you hear what's going on in Germany about the Nazis' behavior there? Did you know no, something? No. Uh, in 39, we heard that Warsaw was bombed, and my mother was very concerned about her family, but that was the end. We just never mm -hmm. heard from anybody else. My father's brother, that was very close to us, who ultimately brought me to this country um, was on his way to Belgium, but he turned around and went right back to, to United States of America. So he's the one that survived and United later States. on brought me over here. Yeah. I see. So the war broke out. It broke out. World War. And uh, what, what war went on with Well, the life? first few years were not bad. The Germans in 1940 did not start anything with the Jews. And uh, my brother was a pianist. I understand he was brilliant. He would have been one of the greatest pianists in Europe. He started at three and he was... And so we, as a matter of fact, I went to school until I was uh, at least in the third year of high school. And then the Germans came and um, decided that Jews couldn't, were not allowed to go to school anymore. And we had to wear uh, a yellow star. And many of the Jews I know took the yellow star and wore it. I thought, my parents thought it was crazy to walk around with that. But the first day that you had to wear it, I remember my school in form of protest, all the children wore a yellow star. I had a, I had a, a dentist appointment that day, so I was there, but I came the next day and my headmistress was very furious with me. She said, don't you know the Germans get very mad if you do this? To make a long story short, I stayed until the end of the semester. And then we went into hiding. When was it? Date-wise? Uh, when was it? Date-wise. When was it when you went into hiding? I don't know date. Uh, Approximately year? Let's say 39. It was, a, was about 41. That you so had to, I mean, what was the reason that you went to hiding? They started Well, we figured, yeah, we figured. They started They going. didn't start, we, di we really didn't know what was going on. But they, there was an edict that said all Jews should come to the uh, train station. And that they will go somewhere where they will work in peace. We didn't believe it, but a lot of people believed it. So, so in we what, decided. In which town did you live that in? Be, uh, Brussels. In Brussels. And my father decided that that was time to start uh, getting uh, uh, hiding. So let's hear about your hiding. Period. So what happened is that we found somebody that had a room in an attic. And also in Brussels. In Brussels. Interesting thing is that I know Brussels like the back of my hand. But after the war, I wouldn't remember where it was. I just lately found the address somewhere. But I just subconsciously, I didn't want to remember it. Uh, we moved in there. And we had some money, and we paid this woman that owned the, 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 the house. Um, we were not there. That was already towards, we were about, we stayed there until about, when somebody denounced my parents. We were denounced by somebody. Before this denouncing problem, can you describe me what kind of hiding was it there? How it was did a, you live there? It was a one-room apartment. It wasn't bad if you didn't look Jewish. You could go out and do some marketing or anything. The conditions in Belgium were not so terrible in Brussels. So you add, in addition, Aryan papers? Yes, Greek? we had, oh, I don't know where we went. I, you had Aryan papers. I had false papers that friends of ours gave us. Um, I, what we did, we got, 
false identity cards in the name of some friends of ours. So in case something happened, that we, we said, well, this is my name, if it has to be verified. My name during the war was Simon Del Stange. I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, we were hiding for a while, and um, I used to be able to go out because I didn't look Jewish. My mother could never go out because she looked quite Jewish, and my father uh, got around. He spoke with an accent, so in Belgium he did a little business on the side. When he went somewhere where it was Flemish, he said he was a Walloon, and when he went somewhere where it was Walloon, he said he was Flemish. Because it means he went to do some business yeah, while hiding? Yeah. During so the hiding? We, yeah, so we could go back and forward. In no, there was no being hidden by, the, by a specific family there? Yes. You, what was the family name? Altman was the name. Yeah. And they were Christians? It was a, a widow lady. And she was paid for this? Yeah, she wanted to make a little money on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but she endangered yourself, she, uh, herself, she knew she about it. She endangered herself, which is interesting, which I want to tell you. When, finally, but there's something else I'll tell you before, but right. when finally the Germans got to us, and I escaped, but they took my father, my mother, and my brother, they didn't do anything to her, because she had a brother-in-law who was English, who was the trainer of the horses of a German general. And they figured if they do something to her, they'll have to do something to the, the German. And he was a friend of all the German generals. And he used to send chocolate in, and so, so they didn't do anything to her. She was lucky. And her brother knew about, about you hiding there, too? Her brother-in-law, no. Nobody knew. Nobody he, knew. Just, he was flabbergasted when he found I out. In, so. in 1942, my brother and myself decided to, go to, to run away to Switzerland. While hiding? While hiding. We took some money with us, and a Christian friend, a uh, pianist like my brother, Tristan Risselin is his name, we decided to go by bus to the frontier, and a, and a priest was going to take us and over the frontier. Unfortunately, he was taken by the Germans the night before we were told. So we were on bicycles. We went into this bus, and we said, well, we'll try to do it ourselves. Maybe we can get there. But by the time we got to a town called Besançon, I don't know if you know, but when you, when you uh, go, went anywhere during the war, you went a few paces. The Germans used to stop the buses, the, wherever you were, and identity cards, see if you had a gun or whatever. So they stopped it. And we looked suspicious, so they took us into this big fortress, which incidentally became a, a museum now the, about the Jews that were there. And we got there. Um, there was a big to-do, I remember, when I got there, because some Jew just committed suicide. And they were going to put me with the Jewish ladies. Now, I was smart enough, I was, how old was I, 15, 14, to say, I don't want you to put me with Jews. I hate Jews, I don't want to be with Jews. So they said, all right, the only place we can put you with is with prostitutes. I said, I like prostitutes better. So they put me into a, a cell with the prostitute. The next morning, they made me, the, the ladies went for a walk, and, and I was cleaning the cell, and the soldier came in. He said that the commandant or whoever was in charge wants to speak to me. And so I w went there, and he said to me, I saw you coming yesterday. He said, and I, unfortunately, I found out that one of the two young men is Jewish because he's circumcised. So I decided, because if I keep them here, I will have to keep you too. And you are the living image of my daughter, and I will not have it on my conscience that I did something to you. So please leave France as fast as you can. And uh, so as a, I figured I was lucky I could have been dead by then. So Three we went back to was released too? We were all released. We went back, back to, to, Belgium. to Belgium. And we stayed there. And you continued your hiding there? We continued my hiding. Now, wo what happened later? Uh, while yeah, I, I, there's I, something else I wanted to tell you. Yeah. It will come back to me. Okay. We continued hiding. 
in my heart, I knew that sooner or later the Germans were going to get us. Why did you add such a feeling? Because we had very, there were very few Jews left that it didn't happen to. And uh, people denounced other people. And I never could sleep at night. I, wouldn't, I was afraid to go to sleep because I've, if you heard a, a car during the night, it was either the Gestapo or the underground army, who, nobody else. And every time I heard something, my heart used to beat so hard. I used to hear it in my ears. I, as a child, I was just terrified. But I wouldn't tell my mother I had a little plan. I wouldn't tell her about it. Uh, that in case the Germans come, I noticed that the bathroom was added to the, to the house. So there was a little window on it so you could escape through the window and lie on the, the roof. So I said, if something happens, that's what I'm going to do. Well, that was the 9th of January. They came. 42. 42, I think. No, no, 44. 44? Yeah. It oh, was so you lived there in hiding until 44. Yeah, yeah. And they came and they had a log. You know, they used to have a log and just go right through the door. And that was it. They came up and I put a coat on and I think some slippers. And I ra started running away. My mother says, where are you going? And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to let them take me like a sheep. I will try to run away first. So she said, stay here. I said, no, I can't stay here. And I went through the little window and laid down on that and stayed there. I think they knew there was one more person because they started looking. My brother went into a, there was another attic higher up, but they went after him and they got him. So there I am. It's snowing on me. All, it's in the middle of the night. And I have to come out, but I could not come out through the front because they had a, a sentinel there, a German standing. So I went on, so there was a tree, so I went on a tree and climbed down the tree and went to the neighbor. The neighbor was a man that was working for the king of Belgium and he had 13 daughters. It sounds crazy, but he had 13 daughters. I knocked at the door and I said, could you help me? The Germans just took my parents. He said, sorry, it's too dangerous. I cannot help you. So I knocked again, and I said to him, let me speak to your wife. So the wife came in. I said, you have daughters. How would you feel if your daughters were in my situation? Why can't you help me? All I want is that I could go out of the door and to, through your house. So she said, wait a minute, because I was soaked. You know, She got me a, a coat. She got me a, a scarf, and I was clever enough to take the scarf and made a turban. I was afraid they might find out who I am from my identity card that they had. And she gave me five francs and a pocketbook and a pair of shoes and um, stockings. And away I went. And I went through the, the... When I walked out, my legs wouldn't let me walk. I remember very vividly, I probably, the emotion, I, I couldn't put one foot in front of the others. So I sat down on a bench, there was a bench, and I said to myself, Beatrice, you better walk or you're going to get killed. And I said, your mother would be proud of you if you walked. So I st started talking to myself. I said, one step, another step, and another step, and another step, and I started walking. I went to several friends because I knew there was going to be a curfew after 8 o'clock at that time. They didn't expect people to be outside. I don't know, it was 8 or 10 o'clock. Nobody wanted to help me because they were afraid. And I, I really didn't, I could understand. It was a very difficult thing. I didn't have an identity card. I was afraid that they would catch me because they were asking every minute, identity card. I had this money, and I said to myself, my brother was going to the conservatoire. There was a teacher there that looked Jewish to me. Nobody said he was Jewish, which we found out that he was. Somehow he got away, and he was living, and he was all right. Maybe I should call him up, and he could help me. So I, this is interesting, too, because I went to a grocery store. And in those years, you couldn't just go and make a telephone call. You had to go and, 
and uh, buy something. So I bought a, a, a jar of pickles. And I said, can I make a telephone call? And I called up Mr. Gertleo is his name. I think he's still alive. He was alive two years ago. And I said to him, Mr. Gertleo, something happened. I explained what happened. I need an identity card. Do you think you can help me? He said, yes, I think I can help you. Call me back in three days. I said to myself, where the hell am I going to go for three days? But anyway, I was happy about that. Um, I go back on the bus. And I said to myself, I'm going to go to Jeanne, the one that rescued my, uh, my pictures, because I figured Jeanne would, uh, would take me. On my way to Jeanne, they stopped the, the tramway identity card. I had no identity card. So the German soldier comes up to me and says, identity card. So I look in my pocketbook. I said, gee, I don't have, oh, I must have forgotten it. He says, that's a terrible thing. How can you? And I said, hold on. Hold to that pickle. i never forget. I gave him the jar of pickle to hold. I said, I'll look again. I said, haven't you ever forgotten anything? He says, all right. You have to talk to the officer. He says, all right. I'll go to the officer with you. I went to the officer. Officer looked at me. He says, what happened? I said, I forgot my identity card. I'm sorry. My mother always says I forget everything. So he says to me, well, you better do it better next time. What's your name? He says, do you think that you'll be free tonight? He sa I said, yes. I said, do you want to make a date? So he said, all right, go. So I left, and I got to my girlfriend, Jeanne. And when I got there, these are people that were very hardworking Belgian people. Belgian people work very hard. They worked like slaves. They had a garage. But 4 o'clock in the morning, they used to get up every morning and have these big cauliflowers that they used to take and sell. They worked hard. So when they helped me, they jeopardized their entire life. When I came in, I said, I have this picture of those people that I told you. I said, Mrs. Lichtet, I have no place to stay tonight. She says, Beatrice, my house is your house. Can you pause this picture? I don't, I don't think I have it here. I have it in here. I think you have it here. Do we have the no, picture? No, they're, they're in the... It's a little picture. Yeah, here we are. I still see my girlfriend when Can I'm in Belgium. Can you repeat their name, please? What, their what name is Lea and Jean-Baptiste Lichtert. Very lovely people. Anyway, I stayed there for three nights. I called up. The professor, he got me an identity card. And then they got me, the underground army got me into a convent disguised as a nun. I have a picture here of what I looked like when I was a nun. I was 16 at this point. Hold it, hold it, hold it. OK. And that convent really was a, a convent that was dilapidated. They gave it up, but they opened it up. The underground army opened it up, and they had an old nun there that was quite a character, 85 years old. And they had approximately, I'd say, 80 or so Jewish children from the age of two, three, until 10, maybe. The poor kids, it was uh, terrible, because they had to know new names. They don't know what hit them. and. Uh, there they were, and the place was f cold. I froze my feet off while I was there. But anyway, we had a woman, a German citizen, that was uh, uh, working for the underground army. And she worked at the Gestapo. And if there was any sign that the Gestapo was interested in coming and seeing what's going on in the convent, she would immediately call up. And they would get rid of the kids that w could say something that they shouldn't. There was a priest, too. I stayed there very long, not too long. Um, somebody, the woman that we paid f uh, in the um, uh, hiding place in the hiding place had a uh, cousin in the Ardennes. So I went to the Ardennes, and I stayed there until the liberation. The Germans. It was a town that never had any Germans. But also interesting, I became quite friendly with the town people that were there. And I never knew any anti-Semitism in Belgium, because it was unheard of. But these people apparently were very Catholic. 
after they discovered who I was, because I said that I was a cousin of those people, and they had these V1s, you know, the, 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 they were bombing in Brussels, so I, I escaped, and everybody accepted it. They didn't want to talk to me when they discovered I was Jewish, which was, I was flabbergasted. It never happened to me before. But anyway, I was liberated by the Americans. The English liberated Brussels. But I was, I, and I'll never forget, I was standing there and I saw these soldiers coming up to, through a path on the little jeeps. And I wasn't sure who they were because, the, you know, the, what do you call the helmets? were very much like the Germans. Young people exhausted and everybody was offering them some wine and so on. And uh, I was liberated. And all I could think. When was it? It was a few days after um, they debarked, you know. It was must, I think it was the 9th or so of June. 44. Yeah, 44, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I went back to Brussels then to this woman. And uh, my uncle found me. He started to, f to try to find out where I am. And he found out that uh, through the Red Cross, you mean your uncle from the My s uncle, which was here in the in States. That was in States, found me. Mm -hmm. And I, um, and uh, we got in touch. And it took some time, and I went to America. So, I mean, you stayed some time in Belgium after yeah. the liberation. Mm -hmm. Until when? I came in 1947. So, in, until 47? No, I didn't. No, I, my uncle sent me to... London, where I had some kind of vague relatives, and I went to school there. I see. To, uh, but being uh, in Belgium after the liberation, yeah. and I was later there. in London or in, uh, in England, did you have a chance to find out About my by parents. some other survivor what was the fate of well, your parents and your brother? I tried, and they had these lists coming. They had lists of people that came back. So right. and it was very hard for me because they had this list in the temple, and my name was Stern. There was always a Stern, but it was never my people. I was crazy about my brother. I think I was more affected by the, the, the death of my brother than my parents even. So, and you didn't <coughs> find out, Ada, what happened to him? Later on, years later, somebody came back and told me they saw him that he was shot because he answered some German bank. But I, I was a coward. I didn't want any details of what happened Somebody said they saw my parents. I just, I figured that every time when I think about them, I was going to think about these terrible conditions. I just didn't want, maybe I was wrong, but everybody has their own survivor. Uh, now, what, did somebody else from your relatives in Poland survive? Yeah. My mother's brother survived, and he survived the Warsaw Ghetto and went to Sweden. He stayed in Sweden, and he came here two days before my wedding with his wife and his daughter. There's a cousin that survived that um, is in Australia. From where, I mean, where was he living, the cousin? Warsaw. Also yeah. in Warsaw. He was, uh, the maid saved him, and he was with her. And. Um, then ultimately the whole family went. They said that his father married the maid, but we found out later on he didn't. But they lived with the maid and the father. Now he's married, he has children, and they all became Catholics because he was converted to Catholicism. And he stayed in Poland? He stayed in Poland and went to Australia after he got married. Mm -hmm. And my cousin, I have a cousin here, which is the, the daughter of my uncle, and she was away from her parents for six years or so, and they, uh, they converted her to Catholicism too, but she didn't follow it. She's Jewish now, and, um, and she lives here. She's married, and they all live in um, Chevy Chase. So those are the only survivors. So you stayed also some time in England post-war, yeah. and you completed your education? No, I just went to a commercial sc school and they thought they would make a secretary out of me, of which I was a complete fiasco. And I came to this country and I started. When my uncle brought me here, 
I worked at Henry Bendel's as a salesperson, and I got married in 1951. Now I've been a widow for 18 years already, but uh, right I married an American born. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I never went out with a European. I, re I just didn't want to go with somebody that had some tourists of his own to tell me. So I married an American, and he was a very nice man. I died of a heart attack at 44. Mm. And I have three sons, a lovely daughter-in-law, and two grandchildren. And I'm damn lucky to be in America. <laughs> uh, did you, during the years, being a survivor, uh, quite the only survivor of all the family, and having this kind of story you told us, did you, were you asked by your children about oh, yes. your past and did you tell them the details? Yes, they, know, children, they know everything? My children know all the stories, the big ones and the little ones, and they're very interested. Now I'm starting to tell the stories to my grandchildren. I uh, see. They're interested, yeah. I see. I just, I don't, I'm not the type of person to keep things in, I guess. I was always a very optimistic person. But, um, now looking backward, after all these happenings, you told us mm. mainly the story about your hiding and planning just in case how to escape. How could you explain it now? I mean, that I planned it? Yeah, how, I mean, that, how did it come to you that time being a young girl? To just plan it, and it was kind just of a, a survivor instinct. I don't know. I suppose um, maybe it was a little selfish that I didn't tell. I felt, in a way, that I was a little selfish that I didn't tell. But my mother was always so afraid. She thought, "Don't even talk about it." She said. So um, I don't know. I just felt that that was uh, the way to survive, and maybe I, I just. Uh, was smart for my age, I don't know. <laughs> when uh, did you, I mean, being in hiding, and not being in a concentration camp, not being in ghettos, and when did you really learn about the big catastrophe of the Jewish I people, after, about the Holocaust? Yeah, after the war, when we saw those terrible pictures and what was going on. Still I couldn't being believe in it. Europe? Still being in Europe, right you after learned. the war. They you showed learned. them all over. From concentration camps. Can you learn about the, all the. Unbelievable. Mm. Now, uh, you were liberated by the Americans. Yeah. Were there some more survivors of your kind that you met in Belgium? Post war, some friends, some. Uh, that you yeah. know of some more cases that you met at that time? When you have stories no. like this? No? No. I just you didn't have a chance to meet. No, I, I really didn't know any Jews after that. There were just no, no Jews left. A few that were there, I just... Oh, uh, there was a family that I made inquiries because we were friendly with. They m went to South Africa. I found that out later, years later. But it seems to me that the people that had money, as usual, here I am talking as a social worker, right. got away. And it's the poor people. We were short of money. You could have. You could have gone with the clipper. Yeah, you could have done Right, things. you could have, but not all used it. Some, some didn't Mostly. use it. Well, we, we, we tried to survive, as all of us. But it would have been much easier if we had the money. My brother had an affidavit in his pocket, because my uncle wanted him to come to America. But somehow, my father didn't make a decent living. And my uncle Simon, who is from this country, the one that brought me over, used to constantly support us. And at the moment, we didn't have any money. We couldn't do anything. It was just... Did you find out, after being liberated, who betrayed you hiding there? And who, I mean, no. Did you find out something? There was you no way of finding out. No way. No way. Mm. Now, you told me that there's this family that helped you to hide after you escaped mm -hmm. from the first hiding. Somebody still survived from this family? Yeah, my girlfriend, Jean, the daughter, is still, I saw her And you're in touch ago. with them? Yeah, I just speak to her on the telephone every so often. But interestingly, she, had a, she told me that she had a nervous breakdown about what happened. And she, had, she really, I, 
I think I know, but I don't. Uh, the, the woman has had a lot of problems, and she, I think she's an alcoholic and so on, but we're still in touch. And like we were children, uh, mm -hmm. we love each other. Yeah, it's worth it to deal with this uh, mm. righteous, yeah, gentle, I want to do it, yeah. try and do it. It's mm -hmm. important. Now, what, uh, as a survivor, what message, learning from what happened and knowing the history of the Holocaust, what message would you give to the next Jewish generations? Well, you know, I just read this book, Chutzpah, which gave me food for thought. I didn't agree with everything he said. But I feel that it's important for us to not to be second, second class citizens. That's very important. I'm not, unfortunately, or for whatever it is, I'm not a religious person. It took, I am not a believer. Um, however, I want my grandchildren. My daughter-in-law was not born Jewish, but she's converted, which I didn't ask her, she did it anyway. Uh, two weeks ago, my daughter-in-law called me up. Maybe I shouldn't put it in the tape, but she asked me for advice what she should do, whether she should keep the children in temple because things were not so good at the moment. My, f my son wasn't doing so well. And I said, I will pay for it. I want them to have those roots. I want them to feel, if she brought them up Catholic, well, that would have been. Uh, also, I feel that there's too much prejudice, even on the side of the Jews to the Christians, as, not as much. But I am a firm believer that everybody is created equal, and that it, the way you live should be an example. That, that is my religion. And uh, I don't believe in anti-Semitism, and I don't believe being against blacks, and I don't believe in being any other of course, I'm prejudiced against Germans. I can't help it. But I still would never do anything individually. And I think Israel is extremely important to us. Uh, we would have no respect for the world if we didn't have Israel. What is, the, in your eyes, the importance of telling the story and giving the message to the next Jewish generations? Well, the importance, I don't know exactly, but I feel that also, it should be an example of what should not be done to other people. I don't care who it is in this world. And uh, by hiding things and by not talking about it and by saying, if I don't talk about it, maybe things will disappear, I think that's wrong. And now, I said today in my kids, well, I said, before I die, they have to hear what I have to say. I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but after me, who's going to be around? Right, you are. Uh, you have another photograph, your father being in the Austrian army. Yes, I thought I that would was like you to show us to, to show it to us. That's my uncle and my father and my and my uncle, which was so interesting because the fact that they were in the army and fought for the Germans and the Austrians did not influence the Germans at all. So. They consider themselves Austrian or Polish or whatever it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there something else you would like to add to your story? No, I might, you know, there were more things to tell, and, and I don't think that my story is as devastating as a lot of people. I consider myself very lucky that I didn't go to concentration camp and extremely lucky that I came to this country. And when I tell my children that my life was a good life as a whole, they think it's terrible. They think it's terrible what I went through. But I figured that I was lucky to come to this country and uh, I have it good. Three good sons and daughter-in-law and grandchildren. I would like to thank you in the name of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. My pleasure. To wish you be healthy. 
That's have naches from your children and grandchildren. Thank you. And let it never happen again. It should never happen again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to interview you. That's the story. That's